Okay, um, so my name is Vinnie Baines. I am the clinical nurse specialist for critical care at Providence Healthcare. Um, I have been a direct care ICU nurse for about 17 years um, over at VGH. And then when I went back and did my master's degree, there was an opportunity here at Providence for a clinical nurse specialist. And uh, it was like the perfect role for me. So this is, I've been here uh, for about five years and five very exciting years. So I'm going to be talking about um, redeployment and team nursing and how we restructured our critical care services to adapt to a pandemic. So we're going to go over some history today. I'm going to cover four broad topics. First, I'm going to give you some pandemic highlights, um, just how it all started and what happened in those early days. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the trials and tribulations of doing team nursing we, and the pilot that we conducted in the very early days of this pandemic. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we did redeployment in real life, though not in huge detail, just a teaser. And then I'm going to talk about some of the lessons learned and how we can potentially build resiliency um, in the future. So let's go way back to December 2019, when in Wuhan, China, there was the beginnings of reports about a viral-like flu similar to SARS back in early November and December of 2019. So this is Dr. Li Wenlang. He was an optometrist who was one of the first physicians and clinicians to report this illness that he was seeing amongst his patients. And initially, he shared this information about this strange flu happening on Weibo, which is a Chinese version of Twitter, uh, amongst his healthcare providers, just to alert them that something was going on that we needed to investigate further. Um, this earned him the admonishment from the Wuhan Police Bureau, but he did not stop. He persisted, and him and his colleagues persisted on raising the alarm about this weird flu that was happening. And because of the reports that were coming out, but from Dr. Wen Lang and other uh, clinicians in Wuhan at that time, on December 31st, the World Health Organization picked up on this and they started a investigation. By January 9th, they, they went from, uh, I think, 40 or 50 cases to 928 cases and one reported death. By January 10th, uh, they started, and this I think is really quite important, by January 10th, they got together and they said, listen, we need to create our research priorities for this new disease. And this was really out of the lessons they learned from Ebola. When Ebola um, came to the scene, a lot of people jumped in and started doing a whole bunch of research, but that research wasn't really well coordinated. So there was duplicate research happening in some topic areas and huge gaps in research that was not happening that was really necessary to help people figure out how they're going to deal with that particular illness. They learned that the lesson and that's why on January 10th, the World Health Organization got together and really came up with the research priorities and then they were diagnostic and diagnosis and testing therapies and, and vaccine development. So a lot happened in just a week and a half. On January 11th, they got the gene sequencing, and by January 13th, they had their first diagnostic test for this disease. And January 9th is when they finally did confirm that there was human-to-human -human transmission for this novel virus. So a lot of science happened in the early days that really set us up uh, in a positive way. By this point on January 22nd, three weeks later, there was about five, almost 5,000 cases and about 82 deaths, all still primarily located in China. Although there were starting to see some spread across the world, um, most of those cases were primarily people who had recently traveled from China to other areas. Uh, on January 23rd, Wuhan went into quarantine, and then Hubei province also went into quarantine a few days later. And this is something that I don't think the world had really seen to this extent in, uh, in prior years and with prior cases. January 25th was the very first case in Canada, in, in Toronto. By February 7th, there was like 3,400 cases and uh, almost 1,000 deaths. And one of those deaths was Dr. Win Lang, who had initially alerted us to this disease. On February 11th and 12th, the world hosted a global research and innovation forum. 150 countries attended. Um, they had hundreds of leading scientists from around the world, and many had also attended virtually to really organize and 
plan out the research and innovation priorities and mobilize the funding to get, make sure that all of this research happened in a timely way. Um, they assess the current knowledge, they identified all the gaps and developed that roadmap. And one of the big priorities that they had was wanted to make sure that whatever we did, we did it in a very equitable way. And that's one of the reasons why COVID-19 was the name that they had selected for this novel virus. They wanted a name that was not associated with a location, animal, or a, a people. So that's why it's, it, it has the short name of COVID-19. So novel coronavirus identified in 2019, and that's how it got its name. They also drafted some operational guidelines for countries. So these operational guidelines was shared for how countries needed to manage their population and this pandemic as it evolved. And the case numbers continued to rise by February 19th. There was an outbreak that had been declared in Iran, and that was this was the first of travel advisories that were starting to coming out at the end of February. And I remember this because my husband has, was recently in India and he was traveling back during this time. So this was, you know, an alarming time for uh, South Korea was when we started to see their, their first hundred cases. And by February 27th and 29th, this is when, and I think this is so smart of them to do it back then, the World Health Organization had released guidelines for the rational use of PPE. I think back then we didn't quite realize how important that was because demand for global PPE use was just astronomical. Um, they also offered quarantine advice on how we should quarantine patients, safe, people with COVID safely. This, and I think this is really new to this pandemic that, that never really happened with SARS or other previous pandemics. Uh, this was the first time that frontline staff could see, uh, have face-to-face -face communication and really see what the unabashed uh, experience of, of nurses in China and other places of what it was like to be part of this pandemic. And we had very real, very um, raw stories that were coming out from these regions that really, I, I don't think we ever had that in previous pandemics. So that, that global connection was really quite unique. March 2nd, wow, my husband got back in Canada by this time. So that was good because um, Italy went into lockdown. Iran and cruise ships had tribal advisories, and we had our very first of two massive transmission events or super spreader events. So this was still early days. There was a big mining conference that had happened in Toronto uh, with about 2,500 people from around the world to attending. And Vancouver had also a fairly large dental conference that happened around the same time. And this is probably when we start to shift from cases that were related to travel to endemic spread. We didn't really know how much it spread at that time because our testing strategies had not really kind of got up to pace at that point in time. And March 11th, that was the day that we actually declared a, a global pandemic. And the WHO was quite serious. He, they were like, mobilize your population. This is serious. It is time to detect, test, treat, isolate, and do really, really, really good contact tracing. That was the roadmap that they had given us. Italy had gone into complete lockdown because um, their case numbers were completely soaring by this point. And by March 13th, uh, Europe was considered the epicenter uh, for COVID-19. March 14th, the ban on non-essential travel and the message to return home because the borders were about to close. Those were unprecedented times. And I think the experience in Ontario and Quebec versus BC was quite different because March 14th, Quebec had already had their spring break, which is when a lot of the population traveled to places like the US and Europe and we're coming back. Whereas BC hadn't had our spring break at this point, we were about to go on spring break. And uh, you know, this travel ban disrupted a lot of plans, but it also meant that a lot of people weren't traveling. And I think that really set the stage for why Quebec had a really high peak in cases early on and BC kind of avoided that in the initial, initial weeks. It's amazing how those small details make such a huge difference. So 
The World Health Organization and later our Public Health Agency of Canada issued recommendations for the use of non-medical masks. We got to remember that we didn't really know that asymptomatic spread was a thing. So we didn't really know that this mask was going to stick and, and how much we were going to use it. And I don't know if you saw this particular plea for help. It, um, this was a physician out of Italy who was seeing the the one of their biggest surges in, and seeing a public that really sort of was kind of following the following the recommendations, but not appreciating the seriousness of needing to go into lockdown. And it's a very emotional plea. Now, this is where we were at the end of March. So you can see Italy and Hubei was, you know, in very serious trouble by this point. Uh, but BC and Canada were only about three weeks behind them, because we were following the exact same trajectory that they were following. So I remember the days when we were looking at this um, particular table going, oh my God, we have to be ready in three weeks. And so this is what a lot of us in critical care were doing. We were um, talking to our colleagues from other places. We were talking, we, there were podcasts being published from physicians in Italy and China and New York who were telling us what it was like um, and sharing with their, their wisdom and their insight. And I remember listening to this one podcast, I'm a physician in, in Italy and, they, and, and somebody asked them like, didn't you have like a disaster plan? Because we all have disaster plans. What happened to your disaster plan? And he said, yeah, of course we had a disaster plan. We just went from zero to a hundred in a span of hours instead of weeks or days. That was a wake up call. And the message was really, really clear prepare now, prepare for the absolute worst, and prepare very, very quickly. So we threw our disaster plans out the window and started again. So I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction of what critical care is like at St. Paul's prior to this pandemic starting. St. Paul's is a 19-bed ICU. They're mostly four bed pods, but we do have some isolation rooms. It's a mix of medical and surgical patients, primarily one-to-one -one nursing and a baseline staff of 16 RNs. Uh, we are, of course, the code bed and we, we make up the entire code team. Um, and we also have a critical care outreach team, which we had launched about a year earlier. We have an 11 bed ICU, uh, cardiac ICU. Uh, these are primarily cardiac patients. And because St. Paul's is the heart center for BC, they do a lot of uh, really complex interventions. They don't see as many ventilated patients, but they do see some really complicated uh, therapies in that unit. They're also the STEMI bed, and they have a baseline staffing of seven RNs and primarily two to one. We have an 11 bed CSICU, which is just off the OR. It's the where you can get a heart transplant in BC, um, and they have a lot of other complex devices, interesting interventions they do there as well. Primarily one-to-one -one staffing, but their staffing will vary throughout the week depending on how many surgeries are going on. So it can be from four to seven RNs on any given day. And then we also have a 12-bed PACU plus four surgical HAU beds as well. Uh, I should tell you about the RTs. So there are three RTs that cover ICU and CICU and one RT that covers CSICU and PACU because, you know, never understood how much, how important RTs are until you hit have a pandemic. So let's talk about isolation rooms. So that's about 57 critical care beds across all four units. Uh, there's not a lot in the way of isolation rooms. So we had um, three uh, single rooms that actually had anti rooms in the ICU. We had an additional three negative pressure rooms, but they did not have anti rooms in CICU and one in CICU. And that was it for the isolation rooms, which, you know, we knew was just not going to be enough for a pandemic. So, first things first, let's get the easy stuff done. Let's get some more isolation rooms happening. And how would you're going to do that in a very old building like the one we had? We did it by taking the windows out and installing fans. So even today, if you were to walk past St. Paul's, you will see plywood doors on the windows on the third floor, and that's our critical care area. Very thankfully, we have a rooftop garden, so half the rooms we were able to put the fans on the rooftop garden so they didn't take up space or create noise in the patient room. But that allowed us to go up to like 11 single isolation rooms and 22 beds that were in multi bedrooms, but we were able to create some negative pressure. And it meant that the patient flow across critical air had to be radically different. 
prior to this pandemic, uh, we operated fairly separately. These were separate units taking care of separate patient populations, and that was not going to cut it for this pandemic. We had to completely revamp how patients came into critical care. Any patient that came into critical care for whatever reason is considered a person under investigation. And we had to determine if they were COVID positive or not. So they went into the single negative pressure rooms first. Uh, once we were able to determine whether they were COVID positive or COVID negative, the COVID positive patients were cohorted primarily in the ICU in the multi-bed pods. And the patients that were not COVID positive were in the other rooms. Now, because we were able to create so much negative pressure rooms, we could kind of flex into CICU if we wanted to, but we tried to keep them uh, cohorted in the ICU as much as possible. This meant that our cardiac, our ICU, and our cardiac surgery patients had a different flow into the unit. Um, so we had ICU patients over in CICU. If they weren't COVID positive, we had cardiac patients over in ICU, um, and we had to work together much more closely. Okay, so that was getting the, the, the room set up and the patient flow working. How on earth are we going to staff this? Um, this was from a publication out of the CDC. It's a quite a famous graph about how do we take care of a pandemic surge of critically ill patients. And uh, well, this is what the US came with. They said that we could have one intensivist, 16 ICU nurses uh, with some additional support people, 96 ICU patients. That's the plan that they had put out. And the rest of us were like, what the, how? How? How is that going to work? Their system in the United States is quite different than Canada. They had a lot more people who were mechanical ventilator support than what we had. As you can see, we had four RTs for a critical care floor, and that's all that we could do. So this was not going to work for us. We were going to have to come up with some way that's going to work for us. But yeah, that was a scary, scary, scary graph. In those early days, I don't know if you remember, a lot of things changed and we closed down surgeries for the first, I think, three or four weeks. Uh, I have to really commend the team here. The team here was, let's, let's figure out how we deal with this. The goal was, okay, let's figure out how we're going to do team nursing and redeployment in a way that is going to meet a lot of our, our goals. We wanted to make sure that no matter how many patients we had, we were going to be able to deal with the, the needs of the critically ill patients that we were, going to, we were potentially going to get. And we made plans for like going up to 250%. We wanted to make sure that through all of this, we wanted to do it in a way that we did preserve providing safe care. We wanted to be able to leverage the skills of the nursing staff that we had, whoever came to us, we wanted to use them to their very best abilities. And we wanted to do it in a way that really truly supported the staff through that process because the, the, these were dire times. The first part is identifying who, who do we got? So we need to take a audit of really identifying who are ICU nurses and what are their competencies and who are maybe non-ICU nurses, what kind of skills, competencies, knowledge and experience do they bring to the table and how can we use them the best? I have to commend um, uh, San Dr. Sandra Locke because she led the charge about really getting an in inventory of the non-ICU staff who had critical care training experience that we could leverage. Uh, first and foremost was the ICU, CICU and CSICU nurses. Um, they really uh, were wonderful and they really stepped up to the plate and kind of we worked together. Our cath lab nurses, a lot of them, I think all of them are critical care trained uh, and have some ICU, CICU experience already. So they were absolutely people that we need to tap on the shoulders. Our recovery room nurses are also critical care trained. They were a natural pool to pull from, uh, particularly when the surgeries were shut down. And then our 5A, 5B nurses, our cardiac and cardiac surgery ward nurses, they deal actually with a fair amount of really complex patients. Some of them have uh, ECG and inotrope 
training, they're comfortable, some of them are comfortable with art lines. So they were a good pool to draw on from as well. And we learned that a lot of the nurses that actually work in our heart center clinics, they were critical care nurses with some critical care experience, but they've moved on to the heart center. So we actually had a bigger pool of people who had some critical care experience under their belt that we could draw from. We asked them to all complete a self-assessment to kind of give us an idea of where they felt they were so we can get a good understanding of everybody's competencies and have some way of kind of sorting everyone out. And then we spent some time hammering out what the conceptual model of how we were going to do team nursing. The way we kind of figured it is that the people with the most competencies in critical care, their role would not just be take, of taking care of critically ill patients, but potentially leading the team of nurses to take care of a group of critical care patients. So we figured, and we wanted to keep it very simple. We know that competencies are, are very nuanced, um, but we wanted to get develop some language that we could quickly categorize people and explain how we can potentially use them. So we did this tier model. So a tier one is someone with lots of experience in critical care who could potentially be a team leader. Tier two is maybe the ICU, CICU, CSICU nurses with one to two years experience. Tier three would be a new grad, or potentially it could be actually some of the PACU nurses or cath lab nurses who've had recent experience in the ICU. And then tier four and tier five were nurses who had more remote critical care experience or were from our cath lab or and our 5A, 5B, where they had some competencies, but not the full gambit of critical care training. And then the next step was we invited these people to co-create what team nursing was going to look like. We didn't really know, and we certainly weren't going to go with the, the graph that we had seen, um, but we did know that we had a lot of nurses who had a lot of varying training, and we could probably figure this out. We could figure out how we can potentially do it. The thought was that let's do a trial. Let's try what it's going to look like when we don't have the surge of patients and figure out as much as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. So we invited ICU nurses and non-ICU nurses to volunteer to participate in this try. So it was entirely voluntary. You did not have to do it if you did not want to. A lot of nurses, however, I have to commend. If you remember those early days, a lot of people were like, I'm in, I'm going to do it. They're that kind of attitude was really prevalent. Um, so we had a lot of volunteers who were really interested in jumping in with both feet and figuring this out with us. So entirely voluntary for both the non-ICU nurses and the ICU nurses. So what we did for the non-ICU nurses is we, our educators, um, put together like a mini orientation to the ICU. BCIT had created those FEPA preparation modules for critical care that kind of give you a crash course in critical care. And then the RTs were helped us to create like a mechanical ventilation refresher to get um, nurses more familiar with mechanical ventilation. And then this is what we did is we said, okay, let's plan out two consecutive days. Um, we did eight hour trials. Monday was let's hit the floor. Let's find out what's in the unit, who wants to do it, and who are the most appropriate patients to do this trial with. And then usually Tuesday, Wednesday, and if Tuesday, Wednesday didn't work, we did Wednesday, Thursday. So two consecutive days, we selected usually a room, a, a one or two rooms that the patients all seemed to be good in. Uh, we selected the nurses so they knew which, who they were going to get. Um, and then deployed nurses came down on the day of after completing their orientation. We made sure that we had additional leadership support. So there was the educator was there at the bedside. We had we had recently upgraded to uh, electronic charting, like back in November when all of this started. So we knew we knew that electronic charting was going to be a bit of a barrier. So we had some elbow support for that. And I think between me and Lena and Dion, we were all like walking by, making sure everything was okay, making sure they had lots of support for this experience. And then at the end of the day, we just debriefed and we learned as much as we possibly could. In this trial, we had eight ICU nurses and three CICU nurses who were able to volunteer and participate. We had six cath lab nurses, three PACU nurses, and two clinic nurses. So we got good diversity of different types of nurses participate. What we told them is like, we don't know how to do this. We gave them a, a couple different ways of like, trying to work a room together. And we asked them, you know, figure out which model works best for you. Sometimes they paired up and they just, you know, 
well, let's, let's take care of these two patients together, depending on their competencies. And sometimes um, the ICU nurses took over the care of the patients in the room, but they had the redeployed nurses act as an extra pair of hands or as helpers. It was really organic and iterative, and we really empowered the nurses to figure out how best to work together and teach us what they learned from that experience. So the data. So we aimed that all of the patients would be stable and mechanically ventilated. And they usually started out that way. I can't say they always ended up that way. We did ask the redeployed nurses, what is your perception of the patients that you had to take care of during this pilot? And the majority of them said that the patients were relatively stable. There was like you know, a couple incidences where that changed, but for the most part, it was pretty good. We asked the same thing of the nurse leaders who were like the team nurses. And you can see that they actually had a different perception about the state of the patient. And I think that goes to one, their clinical lens. And two, they were probably taking on the greater responsibility of taking over the sicker patients and making sure the whole room was okay. And which is probably why you saw this difference in perception about how sick these patients were. We asked team leaders, at the end of it, we did a quantitative survey about how you felt about the care you provided. We asked them, did you feel that we were able to provide safe care? That um, did you feel competent in your role as a team leader? Um, did you feel like we were contributing the care in a meaningful way? That you were organized? Were you, did you feel supported and respected? Uh, and for the most part, except for organization, people were in agreement. Not to say that this was not a stressful experience, it definitely was, but they felt very supported with what we were able to provide during that experience. We asked very similar questions to the nurses that were redeployed into the unit about their experience. So we asked them, did you feel like it was safe care? Did you feel like you were organized? Did you feel like you were respected and welcomed and uh, supported in this experience? And the same thing, for the most part, the experience was fairly positive, stressful, Absolutely, it was stressful, but it was fairly positive. So this was reassuring. But the real gold came in when we were debriefing afterwards and we were collecting that qualitative data in the moment. Uh, we learned so much. We learned that um, people did feel like they were supported and then they felt like they were working together in a team. They felt that you know, having a stable patient, particularly in the early days, made a big difference to help them give them time to consolidate. They loved having the additional help of people around to give them uh, support to help answer the questions. Having being able to do at least two shifts back to back rather than breaking it up or changing the assignment was better. We planned out, we did like a debrief at the beginning or a, a huddle at the very beginning of the day, planned out everything, talked through things through. And then we had huddles throughout the day as well to just check in how things are going. And that communication strategy of building that into the day was really, really positively received. And this is the reassuring thing is a lot of the nurses who had more remote critical care experience, they said, you know what, I wasn't sure how much I could felt like a contribute, but having that critical care background, I still, I still have the eyes and ears of ICU nurse. I still can kind of get a sense of what's going on and make good decisions. So they were kind of reassured about their assessment skills. What didn't work? Well, Cerner. Cerner was huge. So we just had a new computerized system uh, implemented in November. We really didn't have a chance to really master it. And the way it had been implemented, each unit, the, the heart center, the clinic nurses, their system looks very different than it does in critical care. So that was a big hurdle to, to really kind of pace out. And that's one of the reasons why we had um, some Cerner help elbow support for this pilot. When the patients were delirious or confusing or demanding, the team leader didn't feel like it was, they were able as, as capable of providing really, really uh, good leadership to the team. Uh, one to two days was not enough to feel competent. It was enough to feel okay, but you did not feel like you could go out, out on your own at this point. The question about, you know, I can handle it now when the patient is stable, but I'm not sure about when this patient deteriorates. And it's a really, really steep learning curve. So it was definitely stressful. There was also a bit of, you know, lack of clarity about the role of how this was going to work together. And I think that speaks to like, we were figuring it out at the time. So we didn't have a, this is how you should do the team nursing trial. This was 
we're going to figure this out. And we had to kind of think through what the roles and responsibilities were and test out different ways of, of working together. Lots of lessons, lots and lots of lessons from these qualitative focus groups at the end of the day. And one of the lessons that we learned, which is just paramount, is that they needed additional leadership support. When you have so many nurses being redeployed and you need more leadership support, not less. So we have charge nurses. Each unit has their own charge nurse. Um, what we decided to do is create another role called the critical care coordinator. And what this person, the critical care coordinator did, you can remember the complexity of getting patients in and out and red zones and yellow zones and all that jazz. It meant that patient flow was incredibly more complicated. So we decided to have a critical care coordinator that just focused on patient flow across the three critical care units. That was their only role. And what this allowed us to do is uh, it allowed the charge nurses, one, to free up their times. So they weren't as deep working on details of patient flow and they could really focus on supporting the staff because this staff, we, you know, we had a lot of changes that we were implementing all at the same time. We might've had a lot of nurses being redeployed, um, who all had different competencies and trying to find out the right assignment was incredibly more complex. So giving them, releasing them to do that was really important. A lot of the people who got slotted into the CCC role were senior charge nurses from the three units. And the experience of doing that really meant that they learned how the other three units work. They had a much better appreciation of the demands and the context of the other three units. And I think it really helped to foster um, cross critical care collaboration, just that increased understanding. And like I said, that was one of the big lessons, but we had lots and lots of lessons uh, that we all wrote down and we definitely put it into our surge plan. And the trial that we conducted in the first three to four weeks of this pandemic in April, thanks to the leadership of Dr. Sandra Locke, uh, was published in an open source journal. So you're welcome to read it, but you've seen all the data. And I think that really set us up to deal with a very, very, um, serious surge. We did actually get up to 250% occupancy at one point, and we had a plan that helped us get through that. So the next pandemic, how are we going to deal with the next pandemic? I think the big lesson we learned is enhancing cross critical care collaboration. We've made some structural changes to how our critical care programs are put together. Um, we are now under one leadership model. We have two managers that covers all three critical care units. And the, the idea is that we're going to continue to foster and build collaboration across our programs. We're not going to operate as separate entities as much anymore. Staff wellness, staff health and wellness. That is the leading priority of our leadership team is making sure uh, we do anything and everything we can to maintain staff wellness. And whether that means granting part-time lines, really, really striving to maintain safe staffing ratios, to, regardless of what's going on in the world, fostering growth and development opportunities for our staff, mental and, and really fostering uh, mental health support. And, you know, we've had some really trying, trying periods over the course of this pandemic, and we've leaned on each other and the resources we have quite a bit to help us get through. Uh, and I think that is the most important thing that we focused on. I think this, this pandemic has really showed that we have to make sure that we get rid of all of the stuff that does not, that gets in the way of providing patient care. So there's a lot of things that we've historically asked nursing and allied health and other people to do that gets in the way of providing really good quality care. Uh, and there's a lot of ideas out there to make that care more efficient. Uh, I remember this one paper I read about getting rid of the stupid stuff. And it was a, a committee and all they did is you shared the, with them all the stupid things about the stupid computer thing that you set up. And their job was to make that stupid computer work a little bit better and not make them do you know, too much data entry and all that stuff. There's been other initiatives like the Releasing Time to Care project, which is a frontline staff directed initiative where they identify, frontline staff identify, what are the, the things that get in the way and how do we make that care uh, more efficient so we can provide, spend more time to providing patient care. So I open the floor to questions. Wow. 
<laughs> is all I can say. <laughs> and so Vinny, from a CNS perspective, um, what would you say were some of the pivotal things that you learned? Oh, so much. Um, some of my buddies are here. So Sharon and Alana, one of the, and, and so one of the most important things is I think we were on speed dial with each other going, what are you doing? Oh my God, what did you figure out? Um, yeah, so I, I know a lot of CNSs and, and, and nurse leaders in critical care and we became really, really close friends. We shared, shared broadly and stole shamelessly. Um, and like I was on Twitter finding out stuff. I, any anywhere I can get an idea, implement it. Vinny, I think you're aware that uh, one of my good friends is the critical care CNS at Hamilton Health Sciences, where I come from in Ontario, and I lived this with her. Not she was doing it, <laughs> but I was living it in the hospital as well. Um, and I'd love to connect you guys to see if there's something for planning for future as well. I know she was um, seriously 16-hour days, seven days a week she because yeah. we were in it right it wasn't it's coming it was it's here and uh, it, it it was um it was war that's all i can uh, equate it to is hallway nursing constant shortages icu doubled up tripled up and yeah so i i, I love i want to actually read that surge um publication that uh dr lock put together and and you and the team um, but would also love to connect you with Angela. Oh yeah, I I, yeah. I like friends. I totally like friends. I, I might actually <laughs> I might actually know one or two. I know a few Ontario folk out there. Yeah, and I think uh, Sherry, you have your hands up. Yeah, Vinny, I just want to say it's it's fantastic work, and and I think what is so neat about the work is you were able to get it mobilized, get it quickly, get it out there by sharing it with your colleagues across the province and. I know that when we were looking at our plans for what we do within our dialysis community, we also leaned heavily on this work. How do you bring in your non-specialized trained staff into various areas and how do you set them up to, to be successful and whatnot? So we did a very similar trial in our in our hemo unit, which was was really great. I don't think we've been hit though anywhere near as hard as ICU. So kudos to you guys for living through that. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's it's weird because you know two years in, it's still we still have an interesting fall. Um, vaccination has made a huge difference. Like when vaccines came out, we still had really really high case numbers, but we didn't have the same kind of um, uh, explosion of critically ill patients in the ICU. There's still a lot. We're still dealing with a lot of fallout, um, but it's not it was it's, it was not nearly as bad as when nobody was vaccinated and we were still waiting for those vaccines to come out. Alana, oh, share your wisdom, man. Hey, you guys, can you hear me all right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I was really intrigued by the question, you know, as a CNS, what did, uh, you know, Vinny contribute to this work? Uh, Sandra contribute to this work? And I think one of the, one of the things that really stood out for me is, you know, Vinny shared this at a regional meeting. Um, so I'm the CNS for uh, intensive care and high acuity at Vancouver General. And um, so, she shared this really early at a regional meeting uh, because they were able to get it underway so quickly. And, you know, we drew upon it really heavily. As Vinny said, we were ahead of each other on speed dial. Um, and so I think the thing that really stands out to me is that the CNSs have this kind of outward facing approach, you know, bringing the connections from outside of a unit or outside of a system into the system, gathering that wisdom, like Vinny was out there trolling Twitter um, and all of that stuff. And I think that that was one of the unique contributions that this work really brought from out there, you know, bringing in the best resources, doing a trial and then sharing within. So I really see that as the a kind of a knowledge broker um, role as well as knowledge generation. So I, I just, Really well done, Vinny, and it was a lifesaver for us to build our program as well. Yeah, I, I stole a lot of ideas from Elena and Sharon and and Emily and everyone, everyone. I just want to know how you found the time to publish in the middle of a pandemic. Oh, that's not me. That was Sandra. That's I the know. Because the sharing of the knowledge, it's great. You know, I think each organization was just trying to to do what they could do at the time. Um, but to try to connect with people and share that information in real time, um, that was brilliant. 
Yeah, I think I think we knew that we wanted to do this thing, and then Sandra was just there. She had done the the um, the uh, audit of all the different teams, and she kind of put the science into it when we were just trying to figure stuff out. Um, and then I, I, yeah, whatever Sandra told me to do, I was going to do it. I took notes, whatever. Um, and she was really the the spearhead of getting it published, which was really brilliant. Well, Vinny, thanks ever so much. And for those of you that haven't seen our movie star, Vinny, <laughs> is I'm... on TV <laughs> and it is in relationship to immunization. Yeah. So hopefully <laughs> her passion for, um, for all of this certainly comes through in her pitch to get immunized. Yeah. So thanks ever so much, Vinny. Thank you for joining us. If you would like to learn more about our association, please visit our website at www.cnsabc.ca and follow us on Twitter at CNSABC.